How do we go about doing that? If we are to make disciples, we must first be a disciple. And we can't do that if we don't know what that is. If we don't know what that looks like. If we don't know the process. We think just because we're born again, we watch rated G movies and listen to Christian music, we sailed right into the discipleship category. It's more than that. It's more than believing in him. It's believing him. It's not just believing in far off God and what he did, but it's also believing what he says to and about us. Do we believe what he says to me? Do I believe what he says to me? Do you believe what he says to you? Not just believing in him, but do you believe him? And then if you believe it, if you truly believe it, are you obeying it at all cost? James 1, 22. Do what God's teaching says. Don't just listen and do nothing. When you only sit and listen, you are fooling yourselves. You know, we can sit here and we can recite scriptures. We can post videos and sermons on Facebook. We can even sometimes finish the pastor's saying, whatever his saying is, or the verses. We can finish it through. But the question is, are we taking what we're learning, correctly applying it, doing it, carrying it out to its full potential, to your full potential? It's more than just listening, because if I'm just a hearer and not a doer, I'm deceiving myself. I am self-deceived. I'm fooling myself. I'm not just fooling those around me or trying to fool those around me. I'm actually fooling myself. <laughs> Luke 6, 49. But the people who hear my word... And do not obey are like a man who builds a house without preparing a foundation. When the flood comes or the storm comes, the house falls down easily and is completely destroyed. Ooh. When I know a lot of information, but I don't know how to carry that out. When the storm comes and shakes me, do I walk away or do I stand firm on that foundation? Because only the people that can carry out what the Lord says are those who can stand firm. But those who maybe have, have the Bible memorized but have never lived the Bible, when the storm comes, they, they can't stand firm. Where are we at in our walk? Are we carrying this thing out, believing the word and doing it so when the storm comes, we can stand firm on our foundation? Or are we being shaken and our foundation and everything just crumbles? You know, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into a fiery furnace, right? And they said, surely God will, 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 will keep us safe from this, but even if he doesn't, we, we still love and worship him. They go into the fire, and they don't get burned. They don't get singed. In fact, they walk away not even smelling like smoke. When we're in the midst of the fire... Do we smell like smoke? Can everybody smell the scent of the fire, the smoke on you? When you walk around, oh God, you know, just, ah, rah, rah. you know, we do that. Let's just be honest so that we can, we can repent and we can move past that. We do that and everybody knows that you got something going on. Now I'm not saying be fake, be real, but where is your faith? Is your faith there that you just walk in, in boldness? Yeah, you know, I got some things, you know, let's pray about it, whatever, but you're not, you're not freaking out. Luke eleven twenty eight. But Jesus said, the people who hear the teaching of God and obey it, they are the ones who have God's blessing. 
Do you want to know who has God's blessing? Look for the one who hears and obeys. Let's talk about the rich young ruler for a minute. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He's this picture-perfect poster Christian. He looks the part. I mean, if you were to mention this guy, he's rich, he's young, you know, he's, he's followed all the commands, you know, all these things. He's well-loved by all the people, all these things. You put a picture of him on the wall and say, if there's a Christian, that's the guy. It'd be the little icon if there was an icon or something. He's your ideal poster Christian in this day and age. And Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple and follow me, you must sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then you can follow me. And he says, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And you know what Jesus does? He says, okay, bye. He didn't beg him. He didn't follow him around. He didn't plead with him. He said, if you want to be my disciple, follow me. Here's the one thing you need to take care of, and then let's go. And he said, I'm sorry. This is where I draw the line. I can't do that. Maybe there's something that God is saying, hey, you need to let go of this thing. Maybe he's saying, you need to let go of some of your finances. Maybe he's saying, you need to let go of some of your relationships. Maybe he's saying, you need to let go of a sin issue or this or that, but there's something that he's saying, hey, if you want to follow me, something has to go. What is that thing that he may be asking you to let go of? And then determine whether you're willing to let go of that or not, and then decide, am I really a disciple? I'm not saying you're not saved, I'm just saying... Come on, let's, let's be disciples. To be a disciple, it means we first deny ourselves. We take up our cross and we follow him. Three-step process. Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must. It doesn't say possibly or maybe or if they're, if they're willing. It says if they want to be my disciple, they must deny themselves, step one. And take up their cross, step two, daily. And three, follow me. We may have read this verse, we may have recited this scripture, and, but I think a lot of us don't really know what exactly that means. What does that mean? Okay, first, deny myself. When I deny myself, it means that I'm no longer the focal point. I'm not the center of the world. It is not all about me anymore. Before dying to myself, I wanted to sin. I wanted to party. I wanted to be lazy. I wanted to chase my own dreams. I wanted to be famous. It was about satisfying my needs. My wants, my preferences. And if we're not careful as Christians, we can continue to think this way. We can still have that mindset of it's all about me. Consumer Christianity. You know, speaking of consuming, you know how many people leave churches because they're not being fed? They say, I'm not being fed. I need to leave the church and go find somewhere where I can be fed. And they think that they're mature. The truth is, if you need to be fed, that means you're still a babe. You're still a babe in Christ. Because if you're mature, you now can feed yourself, right? Right? Yeah, just like a little kid, like, like my baby can't feed himself, so I feed him, but he gets older and he starts to feed himself. It's the same thing. 
Once we become mature, we can start to feed ourselves. And now we, we're at a place of maturity where I don't come to church to be fed. I come to church to feed others. So if you've reached a peak point, so to speak, hey, that means it's time for you to channel into a ministry and start serving. Tell me this pattern, ready? I'm not getting fed. I don't like this music. I don't like the preaching. He didn't say hello to me. I can't handle changes of ministry. I don't want to hear that. I'm concerned. I'm afraid. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, me, me, me. This is common. But it says you must first deny yourself. It's not about you. Wow. That's good. <laughs> Repentance changed the way that we think. Did something just go click? Yes. Amen. Yeah, this is actually going to free you. It's challenging, but, you know, the truth sets us free. We're going to become so free from this. So denying yourself means it's not about me. That should have been the first thing you learned when you got saved and born again. Because, right, if we want to be disciples, the first thing is I deny myself. But we've seen the gone way past that, learned all these other things, and forgot the very first step when you become a Christian. Denying self, period. When you really know that you've denied self, you no longer have fear. You no longer have anxiety. You no longer have worry. Because those three things are signs that you're worried about your own life. When I fear... I'm concerned about myself. When I have anxiety, concerned about myself. Worry, concerned about myself. Start to deny yourself and watch those three things disappear. Wow. Your life is not your own. You gave it away. You guys know the song, I give myself away. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself away. Makes sense. We sing it. Do we believe it? Are we really delivering it? Like, God, I'm actually giving myself away. My life is not my own. I'm denying myself. It's all about you. It's not about me. It's about blessing and serving those around me. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is I who no longer lives, but Christ lives in me. I died to myself. When I became born again, I died to myself. Are we born again or are we not? Are we unsure? Because I could go over it real quick, what it means to be born again. Do you guys know what it means to be born again? Yes. Okay. Have I died to myself? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay, that's the problem. We're a little bit unsure. <laughs> okay. When I became a born-again believer, what I've done is I've declared, hey, I have died to myself, everyone. I'm getting water baptized. I'm going to display to everyone that I'm confessing that I have in fact died to myself and I'm resurrecting and living it with Christ. Amen. Right? Yeah. Basics. I've died to myself. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Deny yourself. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. That's how you overcome. Denying 
Deny yourself. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciples. Woo, okay, that's where you, you draw the line, right? That's where you draw the line for me. I mean, you know, come on. What does that mean? What did, did he really say that? Well, one is he really did say that. It's in my Bible. Is it, is it in any of yours? I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, cool. We all have the same Bible, at least, you know, it's close. Okay. <laughs> okay, if you are a disciple, you may have to deny yourself as a daughter. You may have to deny yourself as a son, as a cousin, as a brother, as a sister. You may have to deny yourself as a friend to certain people. Remember Matthew chapter 14 where Peter walks on water? Let's open to that real quick. Matthew 14, 25 to 33. We'll also have that up here. I'm going to really explain this, this one because this one can seem a little intimidating, you know, or a little bit like, wait, it doesn't look like love, but we're going to get into it. Matthew 14, 25 to 33. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if, it is you, if, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let's take a look at this for a second. First, did you notice that at first, Peter's friends couldn't recognize that it was Jesus? They said it's a ghost, and they were afraid. Sometimes people can't recognize Jesus. And these were even disciples that couldn't recognize him. But Peter takes courage, and he says, Lord, if that's you, I will step out on this water. You tell me to come out, and I will follow you. And he says, yes, step out on the water. And he steps out on that water, and he begins to walk on water, leaving his close relationships behind. He said, even though you guys are unwilling to step out on this water, to go through this storm with me, I will go because Jesus has called me. Sometimes you got to leave some people behind. You know, they could have said, hey, Peter, where are you going? Don't you care about us? Where are you? We're right here. He said, no, the Lord has called me. That's where I'm going. In some cultures, if you become a Christian, it means that you must hate your family. They say, surely Travis must hate me if he's becoming a Christian. And so we're going to kill him. That is the harsh reality of the gospel. Maybe things seem okay here in America, but in a lot of cultures, if you become a Christian, they take it as if you hate them and they'll try to kill you. They'll poison your food or all kinds of different things. Does your love look so great towards God that all the other relationships look like hate? It doesn't mean that you really hate them, but does it look that way? Are people taking it and receiving it as hate because your love for God is so great?
Peter was the only will, one willing to follow Jesus. What if you were the only one in a crowd of people? You have to know where Jesus is calling you. Even if it means leaving people behind. Even though Peter followed Jesus when no one else did, Peter began to second guess. He began to second guess his choice. How often do we do that? Second guess. After we start to walk, we second guess the choices. It is when he began to second guess that he began to sink. He began to second guess. You know why? He began to love his own life. He began to worry about himself. He saw the storm. He saw the wind. He saw the water. He saw the waves. It wasn't just flat. There was a storm happening when he was out there. He began to get scared because he started to love his own life. What about me? What about my life? What if I drown? What if I this? What if I that? What if I die? I, 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 I. That's what's going through his mind. And as soon as he began to be concerned about himself, that's when he started sinking. He went from not loving his own life, his own reputation, to loving his life. The moment he wanted to gain his life, that's when he started to lose it. It wasn't so much the lack of, see, I used to think it was the lack of faith of being able to walk on water. He didn't have faith to walk on it. Now I'm starting to think it's the lack of faith in believing he could walk on water <clears throat> because of his faith in Jesus and trusting the calling and direction that he has for him. It's about trusting in Jesus. If Jesus has told me to go this way, that's where my faith is. So no matter what the obstacle is, if it's walking on water, whether it's a storm or whether it's this, whether it's Goliath, whether it's a giant, whatever it is, I'm having faith that if he's calling me in a direction, that I'm having faith walking in that direction. You know, guys, if he asks you to do something, he's going to help you through that thing. He's not going to leave you hanging and powerless. If he asks you to do it, he's going to give you the power and authority and ability to carry that out. But we don't have faith in him. We put our faith in ourselves, and we realize that we don't have it what it takes. He has everything. And he's just handing it to us as we need it. The Bible says to examine yourself and to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The first thing we do when we examine ourselves is, have I denied myself? Am I continuing to deny myself? Step one. Do you guys know what love is? In simple terms, love is to put others before yourself. If you don't walk away with anything else, at least walk away with that today. Love is to put others before yourself. So what is the opposite of love? People would often say hate. But if to put others before yourself is love, then the opposite of love is selfishness. Putting myself first. See, a pattern. We deny ourselves we put God first and then our neighbors. We fulfill our purpose. You know, brother, but I got a wife, I got kids. Come on, it's not realistic. I'll tell you what, from personal experience, let's we'll say, well, we, we put our family first and then our ministry, but can I just give you a piece of advice? If you do put your family first and you disciple your wife and kids, they'll be on board for everything else. You won't have to choose between your family and God. If you disciple your family, then they're going to be right there with you pressing on. Yes. 
You know, I actually thank God that he's, he's asked me to abandon myself because he freed me from myself. Like I was no good. I was only leading to destruction and, and destroying my life and destroying other people's lives around me. I mean, there was nothing good in me. So I actually thank God that you told me, hey, abandon your life and take on a new life in me. Because now I can be free from myself because I was, there was nothing good there. So it's not a bad thing that I deny myself. It's a good thing. Thank you, Jesus, that you asked me to abandon myself. It's like having a car. Like, I have, I have this car. We, we've, had, we've had a couple cars, and, and I have this car that doesn't run, or it, it, it doesn't move, rather. <laughs> if you jump it, it'll start, but it, it doesn't go anywhere. And it's just been sitting there, you know? And, um, and I, I have to try to get rid of it, you know? How do you get rid of a car that doesn't work. You know, nobody really wants it. I don't know. Take it to the scrapyard or something. But the idea is, what if he just told me, hey, it's okay if you just abandoned it? I'd be like, wow, what a weight off my shoulders. Woo! Thank you. You know? I mean, your old self, like, didn't work. What you're doing, it didn't work. It doesn't work. So what a relief to say, like, oh, I can abandon that? What a weight off my shoulders, right? Okay, here's good news is in addition to that. <laughs> so now he gives me new hopes because my hopes have become his hopes. He gives me new dreams. My dreams have become his dreams. Do you see that? So my old hopes, they're gone. I denied them. My old dreams, gone. I denied them. But the good news is that he gives you new ones, and they're better. He gives me better dreams. He gives me better hopes. He gives me better future. He plans to prosper me, not to harm me. He plans to give me hope and future. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So why would I hold on to that mess? You know, we do that. You know, you, you see that in the natural. You see the, the woman, you know, unfortunately, who, who's, who has an abusive boyfriend, and she stays with them. And you're like, no, there's so much better. But she keeps running back to it. And you're like, what are you thinking? We do that. All of us are guilty of that in our own life. We run back to our old nasty self. And we try to say, hey, you know, let me do this and try to do that. And it's like, no, let that go. There's something so much better for you over here. So we deny ourselves. Secondly, we take up our cross daily. We take up our cross. What does that mean? Taking up our cross daily is living a life of sacrifice. He died for me so that I could live for him. It's doing the very things God asks you to do that you don't want to do. Sometimes you don't want to do it. You know, even, even David maybe didn't feel like worshiping considering his circumstance. He said, I, I, oh my soul, he commanded his soul to worship the Lord. Sometimes you got to say, come on, let's get in the gear. You know, G, um, Paul's talking about, I beat my body daily into submission. Sometimes you got to make yourself do some things you don't want to do. It's easy to do the things that you want to do, but what about when God asks you to do something challenging, like the rich young ruler? Sell all your possessions, give to the poor, then follow me. Suddenly it's, <laughs> I don't know. That's, what's car that's, that's carrying your cross, guys. Jesus paid the highest price for you when he went to the cross. Taking up your cross is being willing to pay any price for Christ's sake. He died for me. Am I willing to die for him? You know, the cross, let me just show you this real quick. Hopefully, don't drop it. 
That's actually pretty heavy. I can't imagine the cross he had to carry, especially all, you know, beat up, bruised, whipped. This right here, it's a symbol and an instrument for torture and execution. It's showing that I've died. I've died. Are we willing to carry this cross daily and die to self daily? Living a life of sacrifice daily, doing things that I don't want to do. Jesus said, if there's another way, take this cup. There was no other way. This, is, this was the path. He takes no shortcuts. Christ is in us. It's not just trying to be like Christ. Christ is in us. He's just being himself. Let him be him. You know, when he carried this cross, when he carried this cross, he endured shame for you. Do we carry the cross and endure shame for him? He loved you so much that he was willing to be beaten for you. Are you willing to be beaten for him? He loved you so much that he was willing to be whipped for your sake. Are you, be, are you willing to be whipped for him? He was nailed to the cross and he could have stopped at any time. He could have said, stop it, and it would have been done, but he didn't do that. He said, I have to show them how much I love them. I will accept this price that needs to be paid. And I will allow myself to be nailed to the cross. He didn't have his arm ripped over there and nailed. He gave his arm. Would you give your arm for him? He was abused for you. He was slandered. Would you be willing to be slandered for him? Would you be willing to be abused for him? Would you carry your cross? He lived on earth for you. Will you live for him? Guys, carry your cross daily because he carried it for you. He loved you so much that we should respond in love for return. He loves you. Mike, can you uh, take this for me? Yeah. You could just go stand it over there. You no longer live, but Christ lives in you. Let him take up the cross again and again and again. Through each one of you, that you may be an example to others what the love of Christ looks like. Does he need to go to the cross again for the forgiveness of sins? No, no. But you can carry your cross daily and his life can be displayed through you for others. Thirdly, follow him. The word follow actually means mimic. We're mimicking him. First John 2, 6. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. That just took the bar and just set that really high. <laughs> Whoever claims, because, you know, a lot of people might claim it, but again, who's carrying this thing out? Whoever claims to live in him, option? No. Must live as Jesus did. So what did his life look like? Look, we don't just follow him to church. We live a life that constantly reflects his because he is in us. It means we go where he goes, we stay where he stays, we do what he does. John 14, 12. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, 
and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Wow, remember that bar that we just set really high? This just really set that even higher because he says, not only should you be doing the works he did, but greater. Bar just went. You ever seen the uh, American Ninja Warrior? And they hold on to that bar and they got to jump to the higher one, higher one. That's where we're going. We're becoming warriors for Christ, going higher and higher and higher. So what is it that Jesus did? He made disciples. He trained them up and sent them out, calling them to the Great Commission. Day and night he spent with his disciples. He spent time away from home and his family, time away from making money to make, disciple, to make disciples. Instead of watching a play, he taught his disciples to pray. Instead of watching sports, he taught his disciples to have faith. He taught them to heal the sick, to raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons, feed the hungry, set the captives free, taught them to teach others, to fast, to love, to eat with sinners, to encourage, to suffer, to rejoice. All these things, just to name a few of his daily works. Not once a month, not just a worship night, not just that evangelism team. This was his everyday lifestyle. Every day he looked like this. If we are his disciples, not only are we doing these things, but greater works than he. So where do I stand next to that scripture? If we were to play a movie on this side and show the life of Jesus over here, and then show, show our life over here, so we have Jesus' life and our life, and the video is playing at the same time, would they look like the same movie? Come on. Come on. Or do we see Jesus doing all these amazing things, and then over here we see a video of us on Facebook for a couple hours? Do we see us watching YouTube videos for a couple hours? Do we see us just sitting on the stoop, hanging out for a couple hours? Do we see us gossiping for a couple hours? Or just meaningless extended phone calls for a couple hours? Television for a couple hours? Sports for a couple hours? Shopping for a couple hours? Excessive eating for a couple hours? Time just being wasted? And maybe a devotion before bed? If we, if we get around to it. If, if we're disciples, the video looks the same. The video looks the same on both sides. There's a higher calling. And remember, he's not going to ask you to do anything that you're not capable of. He sees you capable. In fact, he says, not only are you capable, but this is your purpose. I've designed you for this. We're often unsatisfied. There's an emptiness. We feel like there's something missing. That's why we're filling it with Facebook. We're filling it with movies and television and theaters and all these things because there's something that's missing. You know what's missing? Carrying out the commission. Start to carry that out and you'll be satisfied. You'll have a joy that you've never had before. Go on a mission trip and you're like, whoa, this is the most amazing feeling I've ever had. And allow that to reign in your life all the time. Does my Monday look like Jesus' Monday? Does my Tuesday look like Jesus' Tuesday? My Wednesday, my Thursday, my Friday, my Saturday, and my Sunday, do they look like Jesus' days of the week? John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. John 5, 15 to 20, then the man left and went back to the Jews who questioned him. He told them that Jesus was the one who made him well. 
Jesus was doing all this on the Sabbath day. So these Jews began trying to make him stop. Notice the Pharisees, man, or religious people always just try to get to stop the move of God. You gotta, we got to watch that. Jesus was doing all this on the Sabbath. So these Jews began trying to make him stop. But he said to them, my father never stops working, and so I work too. Wow. Come on. Stop for, never mind. This made them even more determined to kill him. They thought it was bad enough that he was breaking the law about the Sabbath day, and now he was saying that God is his father, making him equal with God. But Jesus answered, I assure you that the son can do nothing alone. He does only what he sees his father doing. The son does the same things that the father does. So Jesus sees what his father does, and he does the same things. The father loves the son and shows him everything he does. This man was healed, but the father will show the son greater things than this to do. You will, be all, you will all be amazed. So Jesus did what he saw the father doing, and we get to do what we see Jesus doing. We get to. What a privilege. How awesome. I actually get to do the same things that Jesus does. So just think about what would he do? What does he do? And just mimic that. What we see Jesus do, it's what we do also. You know, we can be a fan of the Phillies or we can play for the Phillies. We could be a fan of God, but do we play on his team? There are benefits. You get to see people set free. You get to see the sick healed. You get to see people delivered. You get to see people free from addiction. You get to see prayer answered. You get to see people saved. You're a part of that. You're part of seeing people discipled. You get to see and know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He said, don't marvel at the miracles. Marvel that your name is written in that book. You get fulfillment from fulfilling your purpose. You get to be the disciple you were created for. You know how a kid feels when they're sitting on the bench at like a soccer game and they want to be in the game, they want to play, but they're not in the game? There's a dissatisfaction that they have because that's what they're made for, trained for, designed to do. In the same way, that's us, guys. We've been made, trained, and designed for this, and if we're sitting on the benches, there's a dissatisfaction. You can be satisfied. You don't have to feel like something is missing. You get to spend time with your heavenly Father. Some of us have missed out on time with our Father, but you get to spend time with your heavenly Father. You get to work alongside Him. Your children then follow your lead. Your wife follows your lead. Your neighbors follow your lead as you follow Christ. So if you want to make and be disciples, for starters, the three basic easy steps. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Amen?